Well, welcome everybody. This is Steel Pans for All. And um, this is Jeremy Kunkel and myself, Jenny Pelletier. And we are really excited to share with you an experience that we had last year or two years ago now. I guess December December of 19. Yeah, it's now it's been a while. Yep. Um, and it was a lot of fun um, teaching our students at the School for the Blind um, about the pans. And so this is adaptive and integrative steel pan strategies that hopefully you can use um, in your uh, educational settings. And maybe you would like to have Jeremy and his group come and visit you because they did an, just an amazing job. Thank you. So here's what we're going to do today. Um, number one, what are the expectations? What they what the expectations might be for students with diverse physical and or cognitive needs in this kind of performance situation? Um, so we'll talk a bit about that. Um, how to adapt music for different differing learning needs? Um, suggestions for modifying the teaching approach, and finally, how this free pan program can be brought to your school. And so we thought we'd start out right away with a musical example. And this is from the program that we that we did. Um, it happened in December. And this happens to be Carol of the Bells. And some things to pay attention to as you watch this. Now, um, we have kids who are um, deaf, blind, um, kids who are on the autism spectrum, kids who are um, completely blind. We've kind of got a lot going on here, and they do an awesome job. Um, pay attention to the level of the student, student assist that's needed. So some have hand over hand assist, some have um, an intervener um, offering a touch prompt on the shoulder. Um, we also have an interpreter there. We have paras who are pointing as a kind of a visual cue. There's just lots of different things happening. Um, pay attention to the musical parts of varied difficulty. We've got four parts going, which is incredible. Um, and how we, I, I added this to incorporating different mallets to adjust for volume and intensity. Yeah, we're gonna be able to really see that, but just know that we did kind of trade out some different kinds of mallets for students who are just, you know, striking um, the pan way too hard or whatnot. So let's give a listen.
lot going on there. And I think I, it's fun. I love the schmaltzy ending. Yes, that was the best <laughs> part. So to back up just a bit, um, who we are, what we do. So um, my name is Jenny uh, Pelletier, and I work at the Minnesota State Academy for the Blind in Faribault. Um, we've been here for like 150 plus years. Um, I'm a music therapist and I work with students of uh, all ages up through 20 um, who are blind and visually impaired. And um, with some of our students from the deaf school too, sometimes um, we have kiddos who come over. Um, many students are multiply challenged as well with other neurological, cognitive and physical uh, diagnoses. And, and I say that because um, in this presentation, you really want to be thinking about all your settings where you will likely have some students like the ones, um, you know, similar to the, to the kids that you see here. And so um, I just want to point out that we've just got a lot of diverse needs here. Um, music therapy, what I do is the, this is kind of a long definition, the systematic planned use of music by a music therapist for non-musical therapeutic goals. So really, I use music every day as a way to help with physical skills, to help with communication, um, to help with um, sensory integration, orientation, all these different things. And, you know, I use music because it's motivating and um, works in all areas of our brain. And so, yeah, for 25 plus years, or whatever it is now, that's what I've been doing. Um, <laughs> One other little piece here on the bottom, expanded core curriculum. So um, what that means is our students need a little extra skill and training in certain areas um, because they don't learn in the typical way that our you know, sighted students learn. Um, and so music and music therapy is an excellent way to work into that expanded core curriculum. And, and then there's Jeremy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jeremy Kunkel. Um, I have most of my experience in the marching arts and spend a lot of time doing marching band and teaching drum lines and uh, marching drum and bugle corps. Uh, and it wasn't until recently that my body got a little too old to be carrying drums and things around a football field. Um, so we started talking about putting a pan program together and started a steel drum band uh, with uh, Chop Sync as it's, uh, I guess, financial sponsor. Um, I've been doing the percussion thing and performing, teaching, adjudicating, clinics, uh, all that kind of stuff, private lessons uh, for a little over 30 years now, which ages me a little, but um, the uh, experience that I have is um, pretty much uh, all varied between uh, different styles of percussion and performing on different percussion instruments uh, including a show called uh, Blast, a Broadway show called Blast, um, where I really started honing some of my pan skills. Um, I'm a member of the National Steel Band Educators and Percussive Arts Society. I uh, got my music education degree from the University of Memphis. I fully intended on being a band director, um, but uh, different course of life and following the uh, drum and bugle corps dreams and uh, being a director of a couple nonprofits uh, kind of led me away from that, and I'm excited to get back into the education field with the PAN Outreach Program. Um, I was <clears throat> just starting to get the PAN Outreach Program off the ground. Um, the instruments were purchased by Chops Inc. in an effort to create what we thought of as like a traveling school of PAN, a traveling school of steel drum. So we bought a bunch of instruments that we would take into schools and use to teach and then during the summer, we would use those instruments for a beginner's steel drum band when schools weren't generally in session. While we were developing our curriculum for that program and putting together a method book, um, we wound up at Shattuck St. Mary's in Faribault, which is a hop, skip, and a jump away from the blind school. Uh, and there was a write-up in the paper about the PAN Outreach Program and the work we were doing at Shattuck. And that's when Jenny saw that article and contacted me um, and uh, she approached me about the idea of bringing the PAN Outreach Program to the Minnesota State Academy of the Blind, which I thought would be an awesome opportunity to continue to hone our curriculum and see just how comprehensive it could be 
for students of all ages and all abilities. Um, and I don't know, Jen, you wanna talk a little bit more about some of the goals and, and what kind of thoughts you had in bringing us out there. Sure, so we wanted to have um, an integrative experience for all abilities. Like I said, we've just got just a wide range of um, musical abilities and everything else at our school. So we just wanted to really involve everyone, of course. Um, and explore the pans, learn about their history and cultural relevance. Um, I mean, I never learned about the pans in my undergraduate or graduate studies. So, I mean, the students certainly haven't either. So a fun new thing for our school. Um, and then to create a program. Um, our school has a very long history. I mean, a hundred year plus history of having um, music programs and many of them uh, back in the day were very much christmas programs and then referred to as holiday programs and now trying to like i think a lot of other schools trying to really figure out how to move forward how to make that work how to make a shift and it's not gonna necessarily happen overnight but we're working on that it's as a musician and um, yeah, kind of balancing that and, and figuring out what we need to do. But um, so with this program, we chose a lot of um, music carefully that we thought would work, um, but knowing that um, little by little, we're kind of probably getting a little bit more away from that during, uh, during December. Away from the secular music, <laughs> um, like our December program included Bob Marley's Three Little Birds. Um, it worked, yeah. So not quite, uh, not quite Christmassy, but applicable to the genre. Um, a little bit about the Pan Outreach, just an introduction here. Um, it's sponsored by Chops Inc., which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that used to sponsor uh, or still sponsors a, an adult all-age drum and bugle corps as well as some other marching ensembles that go down the parade route. Um, and they are the third largest purveyor of pull tabs in the state of Minnesota. Um, so we are very fortunate to be partnered with them. Um, we have instruments for up to 24 students. So uh, we can have 24 students playing at the same time with the instruments in the program. And we've developed a class, classroom method book for PAN, um, kind of like your Haskell W. Har or your uh, essential lesson books that you use for uh, pan or band pedagogy. We're trying to develop a method that all instruments can use and work on pedagogy together in the pan idiom. Um, we have a practice app on our website, which is at panoutreach.org. And the practice app is basically just a, a digital version of a steel drum that you can play when the volume is working. Um, and you're welcome to check that out if you'd like to at panoutreach.com. The username is student and the password is the number one. Very secure. <laughs> um, go ahead and share that with whoever you'd like. And um, we do custom arrangements and we have multiple residency options. You can certainly check it out on Pan Outreach if it's something you're interested in. The instruments we use are very high quality. You can see the layout here um, and we've colored the notes to uh, give students an idea of how to perform and what notes are where. Uh, just like the toy xylophone that you get at Target or something that has the different colors, um, you can teach via color. And this is a little video kind of introducing one of our lead pans and how it works. This is our lead pan instrument. It serves as the soprano voice for our choir. And the lowest note on this instrument is here, the middle C. And the notes on this instrument are arranged in a circle of fifths. So if you go to the right, it goes your order of sharps, G, D, A, E. To the left is your order of flats, F, B flat, B flat. So to play a major scale, what we've done is arranged, or colored the notes rather, in a rainbow acronym, Roy G. Biv. So we play red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and all of the octaves are directly in front of the outer circle notes. 
and that's how the uh, steel pan, lead pan rather, is arranged. Uh, the double seconds are two notes, or two drums rather, and you've got two different drums. As the notes get bigger, they get lower in pitch, and you need more real estate, more steel, to accommodate the same number of notes. Um, so here's a little demonstration of the seconds here. The double seconds instrument serve as our alto voice. You'll notice the notes are a little bit bigger, so it takes two drums to cover the same two and a third octave range that the lead pan has. The difference is the notes on these drums are arranged in a whole tone pattern. So each drum has a whole tone scale. And it's exactly the same layout on the other drum, only a half step higher. So that when you put the two drums together, you can play a chromatic scale. And that offers some uh, unique challenges, but also some uh, really cool opportunities for chord progressions. Lots of fun to play. I just forgot what I was doing. <clears throat> and then uh, our cello pan, obviously lower notes, more real estate, three different drums. And they start getting a little bit more cumbersome. The nice thing about these instruments, though, is that the notes are so large, they're easy to hit and make sound, even if you're not perfectly accurate. The next instrument in the family is the cello instrument. These instruments are obviously three drums. The notes are lower, and they serve as our cello voice. So you need three drums to accommodate the same number of notes as you have on your seconds and your lead pan. The difference is rather than being in a circle of fifths pattern or a whole tone pattern like we've already talked about, these instruments are in a diminished seventh or minor third pattern. So each drum plays a diminished seven. And then the next one is a half step up. instruments we get the entire chromatic scale about two and a third octaves range. Instruments, voice, so okay. and then our base pans are six full-size 55 gallon barrels and here's a little video describing those. Finally, we get to our bass pan instruments. These are very large, the most cumbersome. They're six full-size, 55-gallon barrels. And the notes, again, are arranged like uh, the lead pan in a circle of fifths, where you have the G and the F, or sorry, the C and the G and the F next to each other. Um, but each pan, each barrel, has an octave and a fifth there's no uh, dissonant notes on the same drum. Again, we arrange the notes in a uh, Roy G. Biv color pattern, uh, sorry, colored the notes in the Roy G. Biv pattern so that students can understand where the major scale falls. So we play red, choice of students so that they can come over here and play lots of different drums. It almost feels like you're dancing once you get into uh, more complicated music just because of all the different movements you have to make to play the instrument. It's a lot of fun to play. Then I touched on the practice app just a little bit. Uh, you can check that out at panoutreach.com. There's uh, all the different instruments that we use. Obviously taking instruments home and practicing is uh, pretty cumbersome. Uh, not something that we can do. So instead, as long as uh, students have a digital device, they can actually practice their music with the color overlays and the notes um, and the different zooms and note labels able to turn on and off. Uh, it's very helpful. And then one thing that we exploited quite a bit with 
Jenny's program is uh, custom arrangements. I arrange using Sibelius and you can see here the colored note heads that correspond with the notes that were colored on the pan. Now uh, normally in a standard um, educational setting where students don't have uh, uh, limited visual, uh, any visual limitations or, or physical or cognitive limitations, um, this alone is generally enough to start teaching those students. Um, but we had to uh, be a little bit more creative with, uh, with Jenny's students uh, from a therapy standpoint. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, the custom arrangements allow for live recording. Um, we can scan in uh, existing scores so that we can add pan to existing repertoire. Uh, and we can create tracks, like backup tracks that students can play along with rather than utilizing a, you know, a rhythm section or a piano or something like that. So lots of different um, customization options for arranging and the music that's being played. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about moving into the school? Sure. We, um, we pulled up in the trailer and started rolling carts out into the Minnesota State Academy of the Blind. And uh, obviously the instruments take up a ton of space. So we decided to set up shop in the gym area, which obviously isn't the most acoustically sound or ideal location for a program like this. Um, but we certainly made it work and that's actually where the performance ended up taking place. So it was good for us to get accustomed to, to that environment. Um, Jeremy, do you wanna, um, do you wanna go into present mode? Oh, sure. There? I was gonna just add there when uh, Greg, Jeremy drove up with the truck um, of all of these instruments, there was a little freak out moment. Um, I knew that there would be lots of instruments, but I really hadn't anticipated the size. Um, so something to think about when when um, pan outreach comes to your school, make sure you have space. Um, I had a quick chat with our gym teacher and said, can we leave this? I mean, because they were for two months, I think, um, all these instruments were in the middle of the gym. And so I felt really bad about that and was <laughs> grateful that, that um, our gym teacher was awesome about making it work, but took up a lot of space, but worth it. <laughs> yeah, in a normal setting, we can usually get all of the instruments into a standard size classroom as long as it's relatively empty. Um, but in the State Academy for the Blind, we've obviously have to accommodate yeah, for wheelchairs and uh, walkers and lots of space to move around. Um, so it wasn't your typical situation where we could ask students to watch their step. Um, you know, we had well, to allow for like room for paras and, and stuff like that too. So. And this residency wasn't like five days in a row. It was um, kind of scattered throughout a couple months, which yeah. gave us time in between to practice. And so it just meant that the instruments needed to be here in a, you know, secure location for um, longer than a week. So. <laughs> right. And um, immediately when we came in and started meeting students, my expectation was we're going to take this music and successfully perform this music. Um, like a music ed or a, a general band director kind of approach, you're looking at having a performance at the end that you want to be quality, you want your, uh, both your participants and your audience to enjoy. And immediately it was like, how are we going to get all of these students to perform these different tunes um, at a level that, uh, will make sense to the audience member. Um, the, uh, the therapy aspect of it really never crossed my mind initially because it was like, here is a set goal and this is what we're going to achieve. How are we going to get there? Um, and how are we going to use this experience to better the Pan Outreach program in general? Um, and I think, uh, I think Jen Jenny had some, had some different impressions when we first showed up 
because I think she was looking at um, uh, her students daily and had been exposed to these students for quite a bit of time. So knew what they had done in the past. Um, so to invite somebody else in and say, well, let's, let's figure out how to make this work, I think was uh, pretty brave. <laughs> so you know, we have a, a lot of students with perfect pitch. Um, so we've got outstanding musicians who will play guitar and piano and whatnot. I mean, really, um, really great musicians. And you'll see some video later on kind of demonstrating that. Um, but we, you know, usually don't have four part music. So uh, that freaked me out a little bit. And um, we, I just adapt everything um, for our students. So a lot have, um, you know, again, it's that range. So some have limited um, musical skills and especially in terms of theory and that sort of thing. And for sure, visually, um, a four part score means nothing to us. Um, in a, in a printed format. So, so there are some, some areas where we kind of had to come together and, and figure out how, how we were going to teach this. Um, and so okay. here's some, were you going to say something? Nope. Oh, okay. Um, a couple pictures of those first, first few days. Um, we've got students feeling those, those bases, which was awesome. Um, they're huge. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a lot of fun just to, to feel those vibrations. And then um, you know, Jeremy did some demonstrations so they could really hear um, what the different instruments sounded like. Um, just the fact that you have more than one instrument in front of you is kind of a new thing. It's not having, you know, unless it's a lead pan, um, like these fellows, having three instruments at, at once to deal with, um, that's, that's like a new thing. So um, yeah, that's what those two pictures are. Yep, and to, to accommodate everything, we had to come up with uh, multi-layered instruments. And what I mean by that is not just having the soprano, alto, tenor, and bass parts, but also um, some fundamental parts. Like this is where we can play the tonic freely, and this is where we can play four or five or whatever notes and start customizing and catering the actual arrangement to the individual players. Uh, there were certain students who did really well with learning the part via muscle memory. And those notes were big and relatively easy to hit because if you got into a general vicinity, you know, you could hit those notes. Um, there were other students that had, uh, would play with one hand and, and feel around with the other. Um, so yeah. keeping in mind some of these expectations of what these students could do um, and, yeah, can I just kind add? Of, kind of grading that, sure. And grading that with like what the paraprofessionals and interpreters and stuff, what roles they could play in addition to that um, was was a was a multi-layered challenge. <laughs> yeah, and the, the expectations from a music therapy standpoint, from for some of our students, the expectation was um, to stand for a period of time and play or to use two hands at once, um, to use alternating hands um, to be able to follow cues, to follow touch prompts. Um, and for some, it was those musical goals to, to learn a whole piece by rote. Um, and I put behavioral in there because there's some of our students who just build up to any kind of performance just isn't gonna work. And so that's where we've got to think about the process and not the product and um, savoring those those times together where we're learning um, even though some students might not uh, I, i'm only thinking there's a few but <laughs> who might not make it to that final performance so um again a lot a lot going on and a lot that doesn't even have to do with music so right um so we spent some time figuring out different adaptations and how to uh, cater to every student's ability. Um, some of the things that we uh, kind of experimented with just in this instrument here, this picture is of a set of cellos and you can see some of the neon letters and circles around certain instrument or certain notes um, 
to aid in finding where the notes are and what comes next. We've also got tabs of tape around the rim. So those students that might have limited abilities uh, visually um, can feel where their hand is and put their hand in a particular position um, so that they know that they're over the note that they need to play. And other students, uh, it was best to let them experience the instrument orally and come up with their own uh, muscle memory. We would use uh, the braille stickers. We'd put little stickers on some of the instruments that would actually have a braille raised so they could feel with their hand what notes were where. And we came up with some, oh, there we go. Yep. These are just little stickers that come off and so we did use those. Yeah. And actually, I don't know if you talked about, yeah, you got it there too. Right, yeah, we've got the, uh, these are, if you can see on the camera that these are actually raised with braille notes um, to introduce uh, the pans and the different layouts. So we had one for cello and one for lead pan. I think you've got a set of seconds there where they can kind of feel the outline and layouts of the notes. Or a tone. One of the other, one of the other things that we spent um, some time working out was, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm talking over you. <laughs> no, I'm just saying it's, it's also like a tortoise shell, but it helps, oh, right. <laughs> it helps when the, the braille is in there, but this was kind of nice so that in their own time, they could feel that. So this is called thermal form. And oh. it's a nice way even um, to, if you're demonstrating what a stack is like or a treble clef or whatever, we can get this in a erased format, which is kind of a nice tactile, um, you know, typographic, uh, which is helpful. Right. And another thing we did was um, we took those arrangements and slowed them way down so that we could uh, put an accompaniment track in the rehearsal setting so that there was something to play along with, um, just to give students an idea of how, uh, the tune was supposed to go and give them like an oral memory of the individual songs structure, you know, like A, B, chorus, whatever, um, just to get it in their ears and have something that would not falter throughout the process of rehearsal. So um, we weren't counting on all of the students to play together perfectly if a student was um, having trouble and, and fell out of a certain section, the track would continue so other students weren't hampered or thrown off. Um, and I, that, that ended up being a, a, a very helpful tool as well. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly how to make all of this work. Um, in this video, you'll see some uh, muscle memory and some tactile cues played by Ben here. Um, let me bring this up and First time I noticed he had a jamming hat on. <laughs> uh, excellent. So you can see he got a, he, he got a little bit lost there for a minute, uh, but then used his hand to find that tactile cue on the side of the rim, and uh, that was like a crutch for him. And and he came back, um, and did just fine. Did you have anything to say about that one? No, it's good. Okay. <laughs> amazing it's really fun to watch these because i'm really in i'm just blown away <laughs> um do you want to take this one with remy 
Yeah, so what's happening um, here? So with some of our students, um, instead of playing that, you know, written out full fledged four part, um, you know, score that Jeremy had come up with, we um, moved things to maybe just playing the root or a one, four, five, doing an ostinato pattern, um, and also not using all the drums, um, even though there's all these wonderful bass drums, let's just simplify, simplify it to a, a root. And so um, here's an example of a student who um, gets into his natural rhythm. And once he is, once he starts, he just doesn't stop and he's on time and it's awesome. We just kind of direct him to the, to the right note. And so here he goes. Right. And as you watch this, pay attention too to uh, uh, Brianna here, who is uh, utilizing the muscle memory, um, playing an ostinato as well. Obviously. The I think that's what's really cool. I mean, I, I really feel like everybody was able to participate at their own level and it just and it still, it sounded great and they were all together doing it. It wasn't like this group is gonna do this part and this group, they were all together and that that was really important to me to make sure. Yeah, and I, I like it so much, we're gonna watch it again. <laughs> out there's another guy in the background um he um was another jeremy who came with jeremy kunkel to to help out he's part of their group and that was nice too to have some extra help um we also had a music therapy intern from augsburg who joined us and she was a lifesaver um with a background in education also so just all yep. those people helping made it Um, so here's a little bit of uh, the arrangement we put together for Carol of the Bells. And the students never saw any sheet music, really. Um, it was all on iPads that we carried around to kind of help teach the students by rote or give them some ostinato patterns to practice. Um, but it also gave us an idea of where the actual lead part that we wanted achieved, and then the secondary part where we could play fundamentals and tonic. Um, same with the alto voice and the bare minimum voice below it uh, to kind of give every student a starting point. So there were some students that could play uh, the as written part and there were students that we had to modify the as written part just a little bit. Other students would start with the fundamental part and then add parts to that as they um, as they progressed and as they got more comfortable with the song and, and what was going on. And then we obviously had some paras. Um, I think uh, at the time I was there, they, call, they called them SIPAs, which were special education personal assistants or something like that. Um, yeah. And they also were a, a really big part of the learning process. So just as an example here, we've got some hand over hand, some, um, you know, just that of touch prompt on the elbow to kind of start that motion and you know sometimes that's all they needed but you can kind of just tell how much fun that they had here yeah, and i think the pairs might have had a little fun every once in a while too i think so <laughs> i think so and um same here yeah some examples of student um who's deaf blind and um able to follow along with the help of Lot, lot happening at once. Yeah, I think the pair on the right is just tapping the beat on their shoulder so that they knew when to play, even though um, they may not be able to, to hear what they're playing. Um, do you want to intro this? Yeah, so um, I think this is our last 
full video excerpt, if I remember right. This was another one from the program day. Um, this was home for the holidays. Um, and it's interesting, a lot of students had never heard of this one before. Um, we do have a student in this group, I think, who's Muslim, and we had had a chat ahead of time of if she had wanted to participate and, and to kind of choose what she wanted to play on. And this is one piece that she was interested in participating in. So um, some things to observe as you're, as you're watching this. Um, we started out singing through it once as a way to kind of um, stretch the song out because otherwise it's, it's done very quickly. Um, but it gave the audience a, you know, an opportunity to participate too, which is really nice. Um, extended mallet, you can't really see this in here, but we have a gentleman who just really could reach the, the pan that he had. And so just an extra long mallet. Um, it might've been like an orphan mallet or something that we ended up using. Um, and uh, again, the level of student assist that is needed is just different for everyone. Um, how students are being assisted is something to, to watch out for, um, and many are participating intently. Um, and then again, the musical parts are very difficult. So uh, again, you kind of listen to those four parts. Um, but again, these I don't know these guys do an amazing job. <laughs> they really did. Uh, there's quite a few with perfect pitch here too, students. <laughs> in that example, but in um, the first one that we saw, we also, for students who are just playing on um, like maybe one, four, five chords, um, we had just like a lead sheet of the words, so the three little words or whatever, um, and marked on there, um, like circled, I guess, like these are the words that you play on sort of thing and taped it right to the pan 
So um, that's how some of those folks ended up playing. I guess I should have said that earlier, but <laughs> yeah, we just circled the, these are the words that you play on and taped it right on there. Right. And it's interesting doing this presentation over Zoom because initially when Jenny and I talked about putting this together, we had talked about having instruments on a stage and inviting people up to experience these different adaptations for themselves um, and you know, put together a, a short tune um, where each person kind of gets to you know, maybe play the pan blindfolded or play it with one hand while finding the notes with the other or playing off a lead sheet where it's just you know, singing along with the notes. Uh, so trying to convey that digitally virtually, <laughs> um, you know, is yet another challenge for us, Jenny. <laughs> um, so uh, the program itself um, had a lot of different elements to it as well. It wasn't just pan playing. Um, Jenny did a great job of, of putting a lot of different elements together. Uh, it was a little different. cheesy, but it's okay. Oh yeah, I mean, I look at the hats. Yeah. I think it was like a phone call and, hey, I'm um, in, uh, give, me a, give me the name of, where, where were we? Um, Trinidad? Uh, yeah, I'm in Trinidad in and Jamaica. oh, I'm in Minnesota, what's the weather like there? So that's kind of how we um, pulled all these different pieces together. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, they all had dialogue in between. There's also a song, um, this might be an interest of some who will want to incorporate, like you said, um, the pans with an existing piece of music. Um, so we had a, a choral piece and just added the pans to it and that was kind of nice. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciated um, Jeremy's flexibility in making things like that work. And some of the narration served well to, um get students on and off the stage. Some of them obviously take a little bit longer to transition than others. Uh, and it was nice to not have downtime between the musical segments by utilizing some of that. Um, obviously, when we finished up, uh, the students, you can see a picture here of the students giving us um, reindeer root beer. Um, each root beer bottle is uh, disguised or decorated to resemble a reindeer. And the people that you're looking at there um, are that are getting handed reindeer are the four staff um, that we brought to MSAD. Not all of them were there every day, um, but we generally try to keep a ratio of two staff there all the time. Um, so with Jenny um, helping out, I think the bare minimum we ever had was three. Um, three people, but part of our, um, I guess part of our implementation of the music education perspective was uh, breaking different groups into sections at times, um, having different instruments uh, practicing their part by themselves and then coming together in the middle and having an extra staff member was certainly helpful in, in utilizing that. Um, this end of the program took us totally by surprise. Uh, you see Pablo there with a big tropical fruit basket that he gave me uh, as, as a way to say thank you. Um, and I, from an education standpoint, uh, I, I can't believe what the students achieved. Um, I was not confident that we were going to be able to pull off the um, musical numbers that, that Jenny had selected um, with the same kind of approach that I had always had with uh, playing music. And that's, well, I want the music to sound like this. And here's the arrangement of the music that I would like to hear. Let's, let's see if these students can make it work. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, um, students are, are just students. You know, if, you're, if your education fundamentals are sound and, and you teach them with, uh, you know, a little bit of love and a little bit of care and, you know, put their, put their experience above your expectations, uh, everything's gonna turn out for the best. And I think um, that's true for any students and certainly holds true to the students at uh, Minnesota State Academy for the Blind. 
Yeah, and I, I think our, our students really rose to the occasion. And I'm, I'm, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking of students all across the state, which these students are from all across Minnesota. So actually folks who are participating today might even recognize some of these kids. Um, but I'm thinking of band, choir, and orchestra and other ensembles that folks may have that, that um, music educators might have. And, and um, there's always that question, how to best make it work for a student with special needs. And I, I just think that um, this was a really good experience for me to remember that I can keep the expectations high and that our students will rise to them um, as long as we're you know, paying attention to reasonable expectations and, and keeping that balance, right? Because if we're expecting too much or, um, you know, hounding too much, I don't know, I, we can have uh, behaviors and things can fall apart and that sort of thing. But keeping that balance and keeping positive and, um, it, again, they just, they rose to the um, expectations and um, they rose to the occasion and raised expectations. Right. Finding those daily successes, those little things that happened um, in rehearsals, even if it was just like the smallest little thing, um, like uh, this person didn't didn't drop their mallet at this point, or this person um, learned three new notes today. Um, finding finding the uh, joy in the process rather than the goal um, was was really great. And one thing that Pan really lends itself to is everybody starting at the same place everybody starting at square one because you're not going to go into any schools really and find somebody who is proficient at playing pan everybody is experiencing a new instrument together from ground zero like this is how you hold the mallet and this is what this instrument sounds like and this is what it feels like and this is what it or this is what you can do with two mallets instead of one and, and all of those experiences are being had by the group at the same time, um, whereas you know somebody might have played piano or taken lessons, or played guitar and taken lessons, or have seen a drum set and played a drum set, this was all this was all novel from the beginning, um, which kind of uh, kind of creates a an atmosphere unlike um, any other. I agree. Yes, and and I'm hoping um, that folks will contact Jeremy and ask them to come out to their school because I think this is a really unique program and as you can tell um, he and his group are just really flexible in working with diverse needs um, both the students needs and musically what what can happen so very grateful for that and here's some um, other resources <clears throat> how you can get a hold of myself or Jeremy and then um, You've got music therapy resources and of course the pan outreach um, website which has a lot of good information too and videos as i remember too yeah and to this point pan outreach hasn't been offered to the public um it has all been by referral and people contacting us um we haven't done any kind of advertising or anything like that um and uh, hopefully with uh, the pandemic, you know, maybe we can do some more in-person stuff soon. Um, obviously, it's real difficult to teach music when you can't look at the person you're teaching. You know, <laughs> you can't interact with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis or, or a classroom setting. So um, we'll, we'll take it one day at a time and, and putting one foot in front of the other. Sounds good. And I would also like to, when COVID is over here, um, one day soon. I would like to invite folks to come and visit the Minnesota State Academy for the Blind and check out our recording studio. Um, we would love to have visitors and love to share music. So please keep that in mind too. <laughs> um, right. I just want to thank uh, MMEA um, for accepting this uh, submission as uh, something worthy of other people's ears. Um, <laughs> we certainly appreciate the opportunity to present um, what we've kind of learned and experienced and hope that in, in some way it helps your endeavors moving forward with your program, whatever that may look like. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.